did a great job. Oh, he did a marvelous job. I feel like Madonna. <laughs> <laughs> trilogy for those of you who haven't heard of it um, most of you who know about you know everyone's heard the term Illuminati by now um, this book was uh, written in 1975 by Robert Shea and Robert Anton Wilson it has three parts the eye in the pyramid the golden apple and Leviathan and um, this book is 
uh, it's funny. It's 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 a um, fictional account of uh, basically non-fiction ideas, and so anyone who's in, who's into into the whole Illuminati thing uh, would find it really interesting. But tonight we have a very special guest, a man who has written over 30 books, who's an internationally known figure as an author, lecturer, philosopher, a stand-up comedian, a sit-down comedian, stand-up philosopher, you name it, uh, Mr. Robert Anton Wilson. Uh, Bob, thanks very much for being here tonight. Oh, it's a pleasure. Yeah, conspiracy is, a, is, a, is a, an extremely hot topic these days. Conspiracy theories abound. Uh, the X-Files is extremely popular on television. Television. Uh, but I know that you've been following conspiracy theories for most of your career, uh, including as far back as 25 years ago with uh, the Illuminatus trilogy that you co-authored with Bob Shea. What got you uh, involved in the, the interest in conspiracy theories in the first place? And I hate to be identified with conspiracy theory because I have so many other things that I think are more important that I've written about. But I can't leave it alone entirely because every week in the mail I get tons of stuff by people who've read Illuminatus and want me to be informed about the latest conspiracy that they've just discovered. So I can't get out of the conspiracy field entirely. <laughs> well, what, what is it about the human psyche that seems to be drawn towards these conspiracy theories? Is it some uh, uh, love of the unknown or some idea that uh, there may be forces out there that are controlling our destiny? Or, uh, well, I think? think there are three factors. A, nobody likes to take the blame for their own problems, so they look for somebody else to blame. <laughs> And if you can find a big enough group, yeah you've, yeah, you've explained everything in your life that doesn't work. That's it's the not parental your, conspiracy theory. Yeah, it's right? not your fault. It's the fault. It's, yeah, if it's not your fault, your fault or your parents. It's the Jesuits, the Freemasons, <laughs> the Jews, the uh, the Bilderbergers, the Council on Foreign Relations of the you know, You got a lot of white choice to pick who to blame. Rich uh, white men. Yeah. yeah, as long as you don't have to blame yourself. That's one motive, and another motive is that uh, we are living in very weird times. The world is changing faster and faster, which I think is due to the uh, acceleration of information flow in the modern world. Information mm -hmm. is increasing, and the transmission of information is going faster and faster due to internet and the whole computer revolution, mm -hmm. which means that most people are living in a world they can't understand. And when people right. can't understand something, they tend to go for sinister explanations of it. Somebody is manipulating things in a way I don't like. Mm -hmm. That's the way people feel when things change too fast and they can't understand it. And the third reason is, uh, of course, that there are lots of conspiracies around. <laughs> uh, you're supposed to be a nut if you think about conspiracies, unless you're a district attorney. Then you can bring in 20 people into the court and charge them under the RICO law with conspiracy even if they never met one another <laughs> and uh, I mean the government does recognize conspiracies every government does there are laws against conspiracy and conspiracies do exist the question is do any really big ones exist such as the ones imagined in the more extravagant conspiracy theories uh, I, th I think it's really a wonderful a remarkable uh, tribute to um, to humanity that we've had for 2,000 years, we've had a religion that's basically uh, based on the idea that a Jewish girl who got mysteriously pregnant was able to convince her husband that a pigeon did it. <laughs> and and uh, people have been repeating this for, uh, for nearly 2,000 years, and a lot of them have been believing it. Uh, somehow the fact that it happened 2,000 years ago, some people are willing to believe it. That's, uh, that illustrates Voltaire's general principle. The, uh, the only way to get any conception of what mathematicians mean by infinity is to consider the extent of human stupidity. <laughs> uh, the Pope is on intimate terms with God, too, only his God isn't named Allah. His God has an unpronounceable name. He's got a Jewish God. Considering the record of anti-Semitism of the Catholic Church, that in itself is astounding that they got a Jewish God and they hate the Jews. But uh, their God is going to name something like Yahweh or Yahweh or something like that, and he's against divorce too. Now, he's even more vehemently against divorce than, the, than Allah. According to the Pope, God doesn't approve of divorce in any case, no cases whatsoever. And the church is very Aristotelian. When they say no cases, they mean no cases. So a Catholic uh, male can bugger all the camels he wants and his brother-in-law on weekends. Uh, he, can, he, can go, he can go out with whores every night and he can come home drunk and beat his wife up and sexually abuse his children and give his wife a case of AIDS and she still can't divorce the bastard because to, uh, to the church, no, no divorce means no divorce. 
You see, the Ayatollah is really a flaming liberal compared to the Pope. Uh, I, I should say the Catholic Pope because there are around 8 million popes in the world today. Uh, a fact for which I am largely responsible. I, uh, I'm a pope myself. As a matter of fact, uh, as a matter of fact, for those of you up front here, yeah, you see, there's my pope card, right? The bearer of this card is a genuine and authorized pope, right? <laughs> Uh, you don't. You don't have to have a pope card to be a pope. Uh, when we started out, this, this is uh, this is part of uh, one of the new age religions that I helped found. A lot of people get involved in new age religions, and the, uh, here's another pope card. <laughs> Okay, shall we do the O-Lock commercial? Hold up your Pope cards. <laughs> Only two in the house? Oh, well, that's okay. I'm going to make you all Popes automatically right now anyway. <laughs> Spectacles, testicles, brandy, cigars. Okay, you're, you're all Popes now. So I've created over nine million Popes now. And they're all equally infallible because all Discordian Popes are equally infallible and they all disagree with one another. I should explain Discordianism to you a little. Actually, Discordianism was inspired by Kirby Hensley, who started out in the 1950s to make, every, to make as many clergy entities as possible. You notice I again avoided human chauvinism. I didn't say clergy persons. And as a matter of fact, Hensley has ordained parrots, chimpanzees, dogs, cats, uh, he ordained Madeleine Murray O'Hare, the country's leading atheist. And he doesn't charge for it. He'll ordain anybody. That's why he calls it the Universal Life Church. He believes that every sentient being has the right to be a clergy entity. And so he's been sending out these ordinations through the mail since the 50s. And uh, they're free. If you want to get a doctor of divinity, he charges for that. That's $20. He's done more to raise the, the quality of religion in the United States than anybody in our time. As soon as you get ordained by him, you have all the rights of clergy, and you can start your own sect, or sects if you prefer the plural. I always prefer sects myself, but uh, the... Uh, when, when he decided to make every uh, living uh, being a uh, clergy entity, that's what inspired uh, the Discordian movement to make every uh, entity a pope. Uh, Hensley has ordained quite, he ordained me, he ordained my, my, my friend Malaclips the Younger, the chief Discordian atheologian, and uh, he ordained the founder of the Reformed Druids of North America. Uh, that's, that's a group that started at a college in uh, Indiana in the 1950s. At that college, they still had compulsory church attendance. You had to go to some church or other. They didn't care which, but you had to go to some church once a week. So a bunch of free thinkers on the campus announced that they were Druids and started going to the woods every week. And, uh, they, they took along a bottle of Irish mist, which they claimed was their sacrament. And uh, after a while, they started getting interested in Druidism, and they started doing Druid rituals. And then they found out the chief Druid ritual was human sacrifice. So, so they quickly changed their name to the Reformed Druids before anybody would get nasty ideas about them. They, they sacrifice a branch off a tree in their rituals. And then they extended it to the Reformed Druids of North America when they got some converts in Canada. Now they got groves all over the United States. There's one over in Berkeley called the Nut Grove, which I, I think is a lovely name for a new religion, the Nut Grove of the Reformed Druids of North America. I, I, got, or I got, after getting ordained by Hensley and, by, and made a pope by Malaclips, I uh, got initiated by the Reformed Druids and I immediately formed a heresy. <laughs> the Reformed non Aristotelian Druids of North America, or RNA DNA. Uh, the, 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 Reformed, uh, the Reformed Druids, uh, in their ceremonies, you have to repeat three times nature is good, nature is good, nature is good. 
And as an un-Aristotelian disciple of Alfred Korzybski, I don't believe in the years of identity. I believe that's what we're projecting outward, what are internal evaluations in our nervous system. So I formed uh, the reformed non-Aristotelian Druids of North America, and we say, nature seems good to me. Nature seems good to me. Nature seems good to me. We avoid all that Aristotelian metaphysics of assuming we know the true na the true essence of reality. The, the reform, the non-Aristotelian Druids, uh, since I founded it, has tripled in membership. There are three of us now. <laughs> you see how much fun it is to start your own religion? Uh, I don't know why people keep going around looking for gurus. Be your own guru. Start your own religion. Well, I've been having so many fun for years with my friends inventing new religions, and we get more and more converts all the time whom we immediately excommunicate, <laughs> since we have no ambition of being religious leaders. Um, the Discordians have a rival ritual. Uh, once the Javakrushians split off from the Discordians, we had to find our own dawn ritual. And of course, Malaclips, the uh, greatest theologian, invented it. It's the, the toad elevating moment, which was borrowed from a Monty Python skit. Uh, the idea is, if you get up in the morning and the first thing you do is eat a live toad, Nothing worse will happen to you all day. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. Yes, I have two questions. Okay. The first part is very simple. What can you tell me what you know about vitamin K? Like, Western, Eastern, you know what I'm saying? I guess. <laughs> I hope. The, uh, Vitamin K, yeah, that's, a, a, that's a very thin disguise invented by John Lilly for ketamine. Uh, ketamine is uh, what Tim Leary would call a circuit eight drug, which uh, Leary classifies drugs according to which circuit of the nervous system they activate. And uh, circuit eight is the uh, quantum circuit or the out of body circuit. When consciousness moves to circuit eight, you are totally detached from the body and body oriented space time definitions, body emotions, and body trips in general. Uh, circuit 8 is generally known as the out of body experience in uh, parapsychological literature. I know the first time I tried vitamin K, I, I, I had an experience unique in my uh, whole life. I was absolutely convinced I was God. I mean, I, uh, I, I have had that. I have had that suspicion on occasion, like most mystics. But this time I was absolutely convinced. And I, I spent about 45 minutes arguing with myself. Now, wait a minute. You know you're on a new and experimental drug and you're just imagining you're God. And that seems so damn silly because all the evidence was so clear that I was running the whole universe. And how could I be running the whole universe on drugs, you know? And so. I, I, I just couldn't believe I wasn't God. And, uh, interestingly enough, you, you can get the same general effect with a lot of the new brain machines that are around now, especially the Hemisync uh, designed by Robert Monroe. With the Hemisync, you get pulses at uh, 404 hertz in one ear and at 400 hertz in the other ear, and the brain uh, subtracts one from the other, and so you're getting uh, sound waves at 4 hertz. And for some reason, sound waves at 4 hertz put you into circuit 8 or the out-of-body experience, or at least 70% of the users have had that kind of experience. I, I also had it with a machine known as the Pulse Star, designed by Mike Hercules in Boulder, Colorado. Uh, the first time I tried the uh, Pulse Star, Mike said, let me wire you up to an EEG so we can have a record of what happens. And so I was uh, wired up to the Pulse Star, which uh, started moving my brain waves down through alpha and theta down into delta, which is where you hit four hertz in the uh, out-of-body experience. And uh, Mike uh, had me wired up to an EEG showing that my brain waves were falling right into sync with the rhythm of the Pulse Star, just as they're supposed to, according to the theory. And I went out of my body and over the North Pole and back to Ireland and wandered around around the streets of Hoth, where I, which I was familiar with. And then I went back over the North Pole and over the Rockies and back to Boulder, and Mike unwired me, and we looked at the EEG, and I had no brain waves at all. <laughs> uh, a 
according to the EEG, I was clinically dead during that experience. Uh, I'm very, I usually don't talk about this because there's enough critics who say that I, my brain seems to be dead. I don't want to give them more evidence, but I got this. I got a copy of the chart. Uh, Mike made a Xerox of it. Every now and then I take this out and look at it, the period in which I had no brain activity whatsoever, and yet I was still conscious and sentient. It's very, it's a very interesting experience, but I think it's postgraduate work for the uh, for those who have already been through the more elementary courses. I, I don't recommend it for beginners. Um, what do you recommend for beginners? <laughs> Aspirin. <laughs> baby aspirin or full strength? Uh, start out with baby aspirin. You don't want to strain your nervous system too much. Then you go on to the hard stuff, uh, for full uh, adult strength aspirin. And then, then if you really want to live dangerously, you buy some Tylenol. That's the new form of Russian roulette, you go. Let's go out and buy some Tylenol and see if we survive the experience.